there aren't many characters as malleable as Mario. He's a plumber, a kart racer, he has an MD, Olympic gold medals, and can probably dunk on LeBron. Anyone can see Mario in any number of different situations and say, You're kidding, right? It's Mario. This is what he does. You don't even question it. And that allows the franchise to evolve in unique ways other series can't manage to replicate as smoothly. But most importantly, it lets Mario get weird. All these games are at their best when they embrace strange and enthralling concepts. Like short sleeves. Super Mario Sunshine! Is perplexing. Lee good. After the monumental step in gaming that was Mario 64, expectations were high for the inevitable sequel. The game was so beloved that many assumed the next entry would just be more Mario 64. And it wasn't just rampant speculation, people were actively led to believe that by Miyamoto himself, who seemed to be very adamant that a sequel with Luigi and split-screen co-op would be the next step for Mario in a 3D space. This project, dubbed by many to be Mario 128, was planned for the N64 DD add-on that failed miserably. But fans didn't forget what was promised, and with the reveal of the GameCube, anticipation was at a fever pitch for the next game in the series. What wasn't anticipated was Mario wearing a water gun jetpack, cleaning up goo with high-pressure blasts of H2O. The GameCube era was a time that's remembered fondly for the amount of risks it took with its library. Luigi had his own game at launch, Zelda was a cartoon, Mario Kart was now a couple's retreat, it felt like everything had a little extra creativity, a little extra heart, and a little extra weirdness. And Mario's first outing on the platform was no exception. I mean, just look at the commercial. People break into song to illustrate the importance of cleaning the streets and dance while Mario picks up a dirty napkin, launching into the stratosphere like he's the man who just ended mass pollution. The concept of making a game that made Mario look like the cool janitor was odd, not to mention divisive. Even from a gameplay perspective, there were many changes to the core of 64 that caused some justified criticism here and there. But before we get to that, let's dive right into the story, because yes, there is a story here. It's not very good, but it's not your typical Peach Gets Kidnapped. It's Peach Gets Kidnapped with extra steps. The Mario gang are on their way to the luxurious vacation resort of Isle Delfino for a little fun in the sun, before they're immediately met with the sight of strange goop-like graffiti in the shape of Mario's face. While they're inspecting the strange substance, Mario finds Flood, the, uh, Flash Liquid Ultra Dowson? It, it shoots water! As soon as you use your new AI companion to conveniently wash away the graffiti and fight off a gross goopy piranha plant, Mario is immediately arrested and put on trial for vandalizing the island, because as it turns out, he's been framed by someone who looks just like our pesky plumber, Shadow Mario. Shadow Mario is apparently a huge knob because he's turned Isle Delfino into a hot mess and stolen their sacred shine sprites. So after a night in the drunk tank, Mario has to do some good old-fashioned community service, clean up the island, and recover the shine sprites. I'd be remiss if I failed to mention that this is the first Mario game with full CG cutscenes, as well as the only game in the series with voice acting beyond a few wahoos here and there. And yeah, it's not hard to see why. Mario! How dare you disturb my family vacation! <laughs> <laughs> this little intro and tutorial is roughly 10 minutes, which is extremely slow for a Mario game. And it's completely unskippable, by the way, along with every other cutscene in the game. While it is novel to see Nintendo dabble in cutscenes with voice acting at this time, something they never really embraced until Breath of the Wild, it's just really bad. Not something that can really mesh into a Mario game. And while I'd love to be proven wrong, Nintendo seems to be sticking to more grand, voiceless cutscenes with some text bubbles here and there, which I'm completely fine with. But that's the gist of it. You're now free to run around the plaza and just have a delightful time. And this game is delightful. The music, the atmosphere, hopping on boats and fruit stands, it draws you in immediately and continues to hold your attention effortlessly. This was easily one of the best looking games in the system. Textures are sharper and more clean than anything the series had seen up to that point and the way it uses its vibrant colors to make Isle Delfino and its tropical environments a joy to see. Look at that water. Am I the only one obsessed with how well the GameCube could render water? Delfino Plaza is without a shred of doubt in my mind, the best Mario hub world in the series. Peach's castle is charming as all hell obviously, but you look at Delfino Plaza and you say, yeah, this was made for Mario. 
jumping from rooftop to rooftop in the sun, delving into the sewers and absolutely gunning it through every street feels like pure dopamine getting injected into my brain. It's also no stranger to having a few secrets laid out across the map here and there, but it wouldn't be such a fun playground if you couldn't show off your moves. Mario's controls are extremely snappy and probably the tightest they've ever been excluding Mario Odyssey, of course, but even comparing the walking speeds between the two is like night and day. In Sunshine, Mario is fast. He's designed like a missile ready to shoot, which comes with its own ups and downs. This kind of Mario doesn't work well with any sort of hesitation. Every movement he makes is a commitment, and if you back down, you will pay for it. Once you develop the skills and the confidence to commit, you're moving at blistering speeds without even breaking a sweat. Every dive, every triple jump, every side flip feels rewarding in its own right. Combine that with the powers of Flood and you can see a strangely fitting evolution from the control scheme of 64. And it's all thanks to this bad boy. You can't have Mario Sunshine without the GameCube controller. The analog triggers are super intuitive and perfectly suited to simulating different levels of water pressure with Flood. The general button layout still feels so natural. All the other pros just come with it being one of the greatest controllers of all time. A good test of a Nintendo controller is how well it can play its feature Mario game, and Sunshine passes this test with flying colors. I'm happy the game's been revitalized with 3D All-Stars on Switch, but those Joy-Cons, hell, even the Pro Controller, don't do the job quite as well as the OG. Not every aspect of the control scheme is as polished as Mario's movement options, however. The camera, while being a tremendous leap ahead of 64's miserable C buttons, had a few glaring issues. While having free camera control is great, it isn't exactly as free as you may think. For some reason, when using the hover nozzle, the camera snaps to the back of Mario 100% of the time. I don't doubt Nintendo knew of this issue and actively preferred this to the alternative, which could have been poor depth perception from the camera not being behind the player during a hover, but it is so goddamn infuriating when I have to fight against the camera and completely halt my momentum during an important hover. It's just one of the few technical flaws with Flood that confuses me. Another being, why are the nozzles restricted to boxes? Wouldn't it be easier, and completely seamless by the way, if you map them to the D-pad, a button that serves zero functions in this game? It baffles me, but I believe they're locked to certain boxes because of Sunshine's unorthodox progression style, at least in comparison to other 3D collectathons. It's pretty easy to describe a 3D collectathon. You have a set of expansive 3D environments with collectibles riddled throughout them. Except they aren't just something to do on the side. The entire point of these games is to collect a certain amount, or in some cases, all of them. What makes these games fun is that you can go about nabbing collectibles to the best of your ability in whatever method you choose. Banjo Kazooie is the quintessential 3D collectathon, miles better than Mario's own outing on the 64. Unique environments to explore, a plethora of moves to take advantage of, and it never says no to your ideas. The world is your oyster. You can usually collect the jigsaw pieces in each world in any way you see fit. Sunshine loves saying no to your ideas. As a matter of fact, it actively dictates when, where, and how you get practically every shine in the game. In Mario 64, every star had a mission with a hint for how to find it and its name but it was entirely possible to stumble upon a completely different star and collect that instead. And if you really hated a certain mission, you could just skip it. You only need 70 to get to Bowser anyway. Sunshine's levels are broken up into episodes, and the only shines you can skip are the Secret Shines and Episode 8 of Every World. Collecting shines from Episodes 1 through 7 in every level is mandatory. You can't even choose what order to get them in because every shine is locked behind its own episode. No matter how many secret shines you know like the back of your hand, you better be ready to slog through all your least favorite missions if you want to replay the game. This not only takes away variety in your choices, but also makes secrets more redundant. Cool, you found a secret shine. Now go get the actual shines that help you beat the game. This kind of format is something that's inching into a linear style of play, which isn't inherently bad. They delve further into this direction with the excellent Galaxy games, but it really doesn't blend in with the type of game that Sunshine wants to portray itself as. It desperately wants you to explore these sandbox levels, but takes away your toys and gives you a stick. You can play with a stick, it might not be half bad, 
but you'd be constantly thinking about how much fun you'd have with your toys, like you're missing out on the full experience of being in a sandbox. Imagine all these finely crafted worlds with eight shines scattered across each at the same time, and the world-changing events that happen between episodes or episode-specific events occurring in real time, like seamlessly curing the poison water of Noki Bay, or getting on the roller coaster in Penna Park. Being able to smoothly go from shine to shine or event to event without interruption would be my ideal version of Super Mario Sunshine. The core of each world's design is of an exploratory nature, with platforming elements sprinkled in between. Uniting them all under a shared theme of a summer vacation resort makes for a very cohesive and immersive experience, one of if not the most immersive in the series. These feel like real and lived in places, and every obstacle or set piece is naturally integrated in the design of the world. Rico Harbor is this bustling seaport with ships docked along the coast. There are these crazy long construction beams you have to walk across, dodging bloopers and jumping over gusts of wind. Simply walking through each set piece feels like its own mini Mario level, and the best worlds in this game carry that same design with them. While the weaker worlds are more flat and run counter to Mario's platforming nature, I don't mind areas with more exploration than platforming, I just want them done right, without boring gimmicks. But you're going to be doing at least a little platforming in every world thanks to the secret levels. Flood is taken away from you, so you have to rely on your raw skill to complete them. I actually enjoy some of the challenges these levels offer, but they exist in their own vacuum to me. I don't really consider them part of the world they're in, or really that naturally integrated into the game. They're just their own set of linear platforming challenges, existing in an empty void of space with floating blocks and obstacles. They scratch that coarse clear Mario itch, but there's nothing beyond that. I'd rather the team spent time crafting more well thought out shines that fit into each world, maybe put the concept of secret levels and make it its own bonus world you have to go through without flood, with really difficult sections. As it is, it breaks the immersion a bit, which is one of the game's biggest strengths. Every world is connected, not just by a shared theme, like physically connected. You may not be able to walk from place to place, but you can see locations out in the distance of other levels. Looking out from other levels to see places you've been to or never even seen before is a really neat touch. It's a small detail, but it goes a long way in making you believe you're on one gigantic island and engrossing you into the setting. The last thing I want is to be unceremoniously ripped from the setting after collecting a shine or dying. I didn't mind the boot-out system when I was younger, having played the Galaxy games first. I just assumed that's how a 3D Mario game worked. But experiencing it now, I see how much of a waste of time it really is. Its entire purpose, even in 64, is to take you out of the action and stall for time. But Sunshine makes the boot-out all the more insufferable by adding it to the 100 coin shines, a direct downgrade from 64 which lets you collect a 100 coin star and a regular star in one level. This may be a minor complaint, but it's a microcosm of the entire game and it's padding. It is so incredibly padded. I love this game, I really do. I put up with these flaws because the core of Sunshine is so enjoyable. But even I can't deny this game is unfinished. There's seven worlds, with two very small extra areas in Corona Mountain and Delfino Airstrip, a little less than half the size of 64's level count, 15. At least five more worlds were planned for the game and left unfinished, and their names, or at least working titles, can still be found in the game's code. Corona Mountain was supposed to be its own world spanning multiple episodes. The game also includes an unused camera mode which indicated some kind of multiplayer with Shadow Mario and everything was intended to run at a buttery smooth 60 FPS. Hell, even when it was shown at E3 very soon before its release, it ran at 60 frames per second before being downgraded to 30. 30 FPS is perfectly fine for the time this game came out, and it honestly runs great, but the fact that a prototype version weeks before its release ran at 60 just baffles me. There may have been some issues with frame drops in certain areas though. Something like the Manta Ray boss comes to mind where there's a thousand different enemies on screen. But with a little more development time to hash out those issues, I think Sunshine could have easily been one of the best GameCube games performance-wise. But it's not difficult to imagine why the game was rushed out of the door. The GameCube was struggling, and there wasn't a flagship Mario game to sell units at launch. Nintendo's known for their quality and are no stranger to delays in development. So it's disappointing they didn't give their biggest properties new game a little more time in the oven. But wait, 
How can Mario Sunshine be a smaller game than 64? 64 has 120 stars, Sunshine has 120 shines? That doesn't make any sense! Well, I have a question for you. Do you like coins that also happen to be the color blue? Ah yes, the dreaded blue coins. Collecting 10 of them means you can cash in for a shine, and with a whopping 240 coins, you'll be cashing in quite a lot. Unless you're a Giga Chad like myself who cashes them all in one go. But that's 24 shines based purely on blue coin collecting. This is somehow the most fun and the most frustrating part of the entire game at the same time. I love scouring each map for the blue coins, and it adds to the exploration element of the game in a way that shines can't really do, being designed as more restrictive and inflexible collectibles. As much as I love searching for them, a good amount of these coins are practically impossible without a guide, and the most mind-boggling thing is, some are locked behind certain missions. How would you know if you skipped one? Well, you can rummage through each of the eight episodes until you find a single coin locked behind one of them, or you could open up that IGN guide from 2002. 240 is no measly number either. That's a huge chunk of the game and equates to more than a sixth of the shine count. If Sunshine got more time to develop, I would have much rather had more worlds and more natural shines than the massive blue coins in the final product, because at the end of the day, it's just more padding. I can't say this game is all padding though, because there's some seriously passionate details put into the final product. There are other more integral aspects of the game that I wish had as much passion and effort worked into it, however. Let's take Yoshi, for example. I wouldn't call him super integral, but Yoshi sucks in this game. He actively takes away from the versatility of Flood and replaces it with a wonky flutter jump and barf juice. Barf juice. Despite how hilarious that is, I went through a deeper rage missing jumps with how janky he controlled despite my enjoyment terrorizing the citizens of the island with my aggressive projectile vomiting. He's also just barely used. You only really use him in a good six or seven missions. Half the time he's just a glorified key to reach something else more important. World uses him in a similar manner, but he felt like a useful power-up. You wanted a Yoshi more often than not. In Sunshine, he's just a burden. And of course, his most well-known use in this game is to sit on a boat so that he can unlock one of the cheapest levels in the game. And boy, some of these levels are cheap. The Pachinko Machine, the Poison River, the Chuckster level. Oh lord, the Chuckster level. Annoying gimmicks that make a level incredibly infuriating through its unjustified difficulty or by slowing everything down to a crawl. You get used to the game's twists and turns with each subsequent playthrough but that first time playing will make you question if the developers thought about where the difficulty floor or ceiling should be at all. Because the game makes you feel like you're walking on the floor, up the wall, and around the ceiling just to fall to the floor again and then immediately get gravitationally bound back to the ceiling. Sunshine is home to some of the most primal, rage-inducing levels and completely brain-dead bosses. Mario bosses tend to be really easy and kind of dumb more often than not, but Sunshine's bosses just aren't that fun to fight and usually have repeat encounters with little to no variation from the first time around. I'll give the second PD Piranha fight a bit more praise than the others because you have to chase them around and shoot these balloon things at them. But a great deal of these bosses barely move, like they are glued to the space they take up. And the less active they are, the less active you are, to the point where you're waiting through monotonous motions rather than anticipating unique attacks or where they end up within the space of the fight. It's a 3D game, there should be an endless amount of potential in using a 3D space. Look at these weird dudes with suction cup feet. They're walking around on a shifting platform and you have to spray them to push them over to one side, shifting the platform and sending them flying. That's a great concept for a boss instead of a few throwaway enemies, because it uses 3D spaces in an effective way. Say what you will about the Manta Ray boss, but I feel more engaged with a fight that spreads out over the map than fighting Gooper Blooper twice. The Bowser fight is easily the worst one in the series. You walk around a ring, launch up, and ground pound the mark points of the arena. It's easy, it's boring, I hate it. If you took the concept of the shifting platform enemies and applied it to a Bowser battle, with a huge platform that's affected by Bowser's weight, you have infinitely more potential than what you could add to the fight, because maybe while you're fighting with Bowser, Bowser Jr. tries to help by creating enemies. But the enemies work just like the suction cup guys, so you push them all to one side of the platform, making Bowser slip, and then ground pound to launch them into the sky. But what we got in the end was an underwhelming ending to a game that's great, but so inconsistent. And that doesn't help its reputation much. When Sunshine first came out, it was considered a bit of a mixed bag. Some loved it, some hated it. But it's had a great resurgence in recent years. 
I've seen more and more YouTubers praising this game for being something new, something different, and something special, and I feel exactly the same way. Because yes, despite my ratio of critiques to compliments, I actually like Mario Sunshine. No, I love Mario Sunshine. It's my favorite 3D Mario game. Yes, I'm obsessed with what it could have been, but I adore it just as much for its heart, what it is, and what it tries to be. And that's the best damn summer vacation a plumber can ask for. Warts and all.